What's up guys, Dr. Gooden here with part five in my mini series on how to program for resistance training. Now, all of this information comes from chapter 17 of Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning put out by the NSCA. In this part, we'll talk about training load and repetitions. Now, all of the parts of this mini series can be found down in the description below this video, or if you watch through to the end of the lecture, then you will find a link to click on over to the next part. So go ahead and grab a notebook and a pencil, get ready to take some notes, and let's dive right into the material. All right, Dr. Gooden back with part five of program design for resistance training, this time talking about load and repetitions. Okay, so remember there are four steps that come before determining load and repetitions, and we've been through them already. Um, but when you are trying to determine your training load, uh, the first thing we want to understand is some of the terminology that goes along with it. Here are some terms that we use to, to both quantify and qualify mechanical work. So mechanical work is force times displacement. So displacement means a change in place of an object. So if you think of a barbell moving through space, and then the amount of force to move that barbell through space, the product of those two things is mechanical work. So if you're back squatting 100 kilos and you are 5 feet tall, you might be moving that bar through, say, oh, I don't know, two or three feet of space. But if you're, a, if you're six feet tall, squatting 100 kilos, maybe you're moving that bar further because you have longer levers in your uh, musculoskeletal system. And so to get to full depth, maybe you're moving it three to four feet uh, through space. And so you're performing more work. Likewise, if you have a five foot tall individual and they move 100 kilos and then they increase their strength and they go up to 110 kilos, now that's greater force times the same amount of displacement, and that would also result in more mechanical work. So either greater displacement or greater force or both will result in greater mechanical work. Volume load is a practical measure uh, for the quantity of work performed in resistance training. So volume load equals weight, whether it's in pounds or kilograms, times repetitions. So let's say that you back squatted 100 kilograms for a set of five, then your volume load for that set would be 100 kg times 5 reps equals 500 kilograms of volume load. Now, notice that this is not taking into account mechanical work, um, and therefore it's, not, it's also not taking into account displacement. It's just the, the amount of weight times repetition. So if you're doing something like a full range of motion back squat versus partial squats, maybe quarter squats, you will be performing much more mechanical work in your full squats versus your partial squats, but your volume load would be the same. So the way that we arrange repetitions and sets affects the intensity value of an exercise. Um, and intensity is a measure of the quality of work performed. All right, so load most simplistically refers to the amount of weight assigned to an exercise. And it's often characterized as the most critical aspect of a resistance training program. You know, how much do you lift, bro? There are other critical uh, factors as well, especially when we're talking about athletic performance, namely the velocity that you can move specific loads. Your one repetition maximum is the greatest amount of weight that can be lifted with proper exercise technique for only one repetition. And proper technique is important to highlight because if we're doing some sort of one repetition max testing, we might see athletes or trainees start to cheat on the movement, not you know, not intentionally oftentimes, but they just don't go quite as deep or they don't go through the full range of motion or their technique breaks down. So we need to ensure proper technique all the way throughout the testing. And if the athlete cannot do it with proper form, then that's no rep and they uh, can't count that weight as their 1RM. A repetition maximum, so no 1 at the beginning, notice there's a 1 here and here there's no 1, so just rep max. Uh, this is the most weight lifted for a specified number of repetitions. So you could have a five rep max or a 10 rep max or a three rep max. And it's important to keep track of those rep maxes. Usually people keep track of their one rep max, their three rep max, five rep max, and 10 rep max. Those are the most uh, frequently used rep maxes. But of course, you could keep track of more than that as well. For instance, you know, for back squat, I know my one rep, two rep, three rep, five rep, uh, I think I know my eight rep max and my 12 rep max. Uh, but you know, most lifts, I don't keep track of all of those numbers. Just one, three, five, and 10 is usually enough to be able to program effectively. Now here's the, load, uh, the relationship between load and repetitions. 
So the heavier the load, the lower the number of repetitions that can be performed. That seems obvious, but it needs to be stated uh, because when we're when when I see you know novice coaches program, I, I feel like they often forget that fact. So load is commonly characterized as a percentage of your one RM or as a repetition maximum. So you might say, you know, we're going to work at 80% of our 1RM. Or you might say, we are going to work at our 5RM load today. Okay, and each of those would be different ways of specifying a weight. Now, this second way of specifying weight means you have to know your 5RM in order to, to train there, right? And so this is why it's important to keep a log of your training loads and your repetitions. So we see at 100% of your 1RM, of your 1RM weight, obviously you can only get one rep. And as we go down um, at 90%, you should be able to get about four repetitions. Now this is like truly, truly maxing out at 90%. And, you know, think it just even thinking about that personally for some of my lifts, that would be pretty tough to eke out. You know, then down to 80%, you're supposed to be able to get eight reps and so on and so forth. Now this is going to change depending on the type of athlete you're working with. Maybe this athlete is predominantly type one, or maybe they're predominantly type 2x so slow versus fast twitch a slow twitch athlete will be able to get many more reps down here in this you know 75 percent range they might be able to get 20 or maybe even uh, more than that whereas they might not be able to get four or three or two or one reps with these heavier loads right so they might get fewer up here and they just don't have the strength and power to really hit those high percentages or if you have a type 2x individual they might be able to hit these uh, these top numbers very well, but then down here, really after five, they start to fall off in the number of reps they can do because they just don't have those endurance capabilities. So this is a really generalized table. Now we have to be able to know how to test the 1RM when we are working with our athletes. You know, if we don't have a standardized way of testing 1RM, A, it can be unsafe, and B, then it becomes uh, invalid or unreliable from testing point to testing point. So the first thing to know is that uh, 1RM testing requires adequate training status. You need to be an intermediate or advanced athlete in order to do a true 1RM. Now you can do a 1RM with a beginner and you can make it safe. Um, and you just all you need to do is just ensure that A, they first know how to do the movement, so practice it a few times. And then as they are attempting their 1RM or building up to it, just shut it down as soon as you see degradation in form and call that their 1RM. Sure, maybe they could lift more weight, but if they're not lifting the weight with proper form, then you shut it down and you say, okay, that's the most weight you can lift with a good technique. Let's keep training. And pretty soon you'll see that they can hold their technique under more load and they'll make rapid improvements. But to get a really true 1RM that really reflects the uh, peak force that the athlete can generate with his or her musculature, they, they should probably be intermediate or advanced. We should only choose core, aka primary exercises, for 1RM testing. This is for several reasons. One, because there's very little ecological validity between doing a single joint exercise and sport performance, meaning that there's almost no carryover. So we're not going to test your 1RM you know, bicep curl because they have no carryover to sport. And they also aren't going to help us program uh, in the weight room very well. Plus, single joint exercises for very high loads and low reps tend to lead to injury. You should honestly never do bicep curls for anything less than six. If you do it for less than six, like if you're using a load that limits you to, to fewer than six reps, that is just asking for a biceps tendon strain or tear or you know wrist problems. So really not a good idea to do this with single joint uh, exercises. We, we really wanna use those big uh, multi-joint, multi-muscle barbell lifts for 1RM testing. Um, and we need to choose exercises that we can accurately and consistently assess muscular strength with and that allow the athlete to maintain correct body position. So for instance, we probably wouldn't want to test, you know, do a one-arm test with the overhead squat. It's just too unstable. Um, it puts, it could put the athlete at risk of injury. One RM, uh, or sorry, overhead squats are great for mobility under load, but we, we just really never want to get close to a max with those. Um, we could train them for sets of three or five or 10, or use loads that uh, keep the athlete, you know, well shy of failure but they're not great to, to max out on. And so we want to use movements like the back squat or the bench press, or maybe the front squat, maybe the deadlift, or you know the max weighted pull-up that you can do, max overhead press. These are safe, multi-joint, large muscle mass movements that we can accurately and consistently use to assess muscular strength. So here are our options. We can uh, use a 1RM testing table, or we can use a 1RM prediction equation 
where we predict the 1RM from multiple rep max loads. Now remember that previous table I showed you showing percentages of 1RM that you should be able to lift or for a certain number of reps, right? So uh, if it's 90% of your 1RM, you should be able to lift it four times. So a, a 1RM uh, prediction table essentially does the opposite of that. And I'll show you that here in a second, I believe. So if you're gonna do a multiple rep max testing option uh, based on goal repetitions, uh, this requires that the strength and conditioning professional first decide the number of repetitions. Are you going to do a three rep max, a five rep max, 10 rep max? Now, it might seem like these are safer uh, to do than a one rep max because you cannot lift as much weight, right? So the load will be lower. So for a three rep max, you're going to be probably maxing out around 92-ish percent of your 1RM. Five rep max is going to be, I don't know, around like 87% of your 1RM. Ten, 10 rep max, that's going to be somewhere around 78% of your 1RM. And although the load is lower, I actually think that rep max testing is a little bit less safe. And the reason is because there is so much more time under tension and because you have more reps, there's such a longer time that you need to focus on holding correct posture. So think about the back squat, doing a 10 rep max with the back squat and those last two, three, four reps, uh, you're gonna really be feeling it. Like you're, it's gonna be really hard to keep a neutral spine, um, to not collapse, to not let your knees collapse into valgus. And plus, if you misjudge the weight, what if you know, you're 10 pounds over and you only hit nine reps? Are you gonna rest, take 10 pounds off and then try again? No, you're gonna be spent, completely spent after that 10 rep attempt where you only got nine. And so three reps, I think, is probably the best if you're gonna do rep maxes. But honestly, I think one repetition max tests uh, are safe. And so I would, I would almost never use a multiple rep max test, at least not as a testing scenario. It's fine in the course of training to keep track of these rep maxes, but not as a testing event. Um, although plenty of coaches do it and they do it safely. Now, if you are training for a specific goal, let's say hypertrophy, then it might be more effective to do something like a 10 RM. And that's because we know that, uh, that higher reps, like eight to 12, uh, induce hypertrophy to a much greater extent than sets of one to five. And we'll see that later in these lectures. If your goal is strength, then maybe you're going to do a one RM or a three RM, right? Because those are more specific to strength. Now, here's a summary of uh, how we might decide uh, to, to implement uh, 1RM testing and then how we would carry it out. So method one is to determine the actual 1RM max. If we're going to test it directly, then that would be this pathway here. We perform a 1RM test, which it shows you how to do in your textbook. Then we consider the influence of the training goal on the load and repetition assignments. And then we choose the goal repetitions for that training goal. So let's say our training goal is hypertrophy, but we just did a 1RM max test. So we're probably going to want to work with sets of eight to 10. So we go look at that 1RM uh, table and we'll see that sets of eight to 10, uh, you can do with loads of around, uh, I think it was something like 75 to 85%. Um, but that would be truly maxing out on those sets of eight to 10. So maybe we scale it back five to 10% and we do something like, uh, you know, 70 to 80% of their 1RM that they're training at. And then that gives us our training load. Um, we can also estimate the 1RM. So that would be this column right here. So we could perform a 10RM test. And then from that, use a table to estimate the 1RM. And then we go through the whole choosing repetitions, et cetera, thing. Method two is to, is to determine a multiple rep max. And so that would be, you know, a 3RM or 5RM. Oops, RM, sorry for the handwriting. Or 10RM. And then considering our training goals, then we choose goal repetitions. Say that we're in a strength phase, like a basic strength phase. So you know you're going to be training with sets of five. So maybe you do a five RM, and then uh, you can work off of that five RM. So 100% of your five RM would be truly maxing out for five. So maybe in the first week, you start with 70% of your five RM. Oops. Okay, and then in week two, you go up to 80% of your five RM. And, and really what this does is this ensures that your athletes are not training to pure failure with every set, which induces a ton of fatigue with um, you know, marginal gains. And if you train just below that, and if you also are able to progressively overload from week to week, that tends to A, reduce the fatigue, and B, maximize the gains that the athletes can make. 
Now, in a minute, we're going to see a, a really great graphic uh, that describes the number of repetitions that you should use when you are training for various goals. So this is called the repetition maximum continuum. And in general, we want to use relatively heavy loads if the goal is strength or power, right? We're not going to get strong if we're using light weights. And we're not going to get powerful if we are not moving the loads quickly or if they're just too light, right? Remember, power equals force times velocity. I think that's from chapter two of the text. And so we want to maximize either force or velocity or find a happy, med happy medium of both. But remember that strength training will also itself improve power training or power output because you're really maximizing this force part of the curve. Things like sport practice and sprint training and plyometrics, those will maximize the velocity side. So we've already got that covered, but the weight room, we're gonna tend more towards that force emphasis. For hypertrophy, we need to use moderate loads. And this is because hypertrophy responds to mechanical tension on the muscle, but you need a sufficient volume of that mechanical tension on the muscle, which is known as time under tension. So time under tension matters because it sends, uh, the more time under tension you can accrue, the, the more uh, stimulus for growth your musculature receives. So you can't go too heavy because that means that you have to reduce the number of reps that you're performing. Um, but you can't go too light because then that reduces the mechanical tension. So we want moderate loads with high volumes for hypertrophy. And then for muscular endurance, we want to use light loads. And this is because we, for muscular endurance, we have to extend the set out past you know, 15 or even higher than 20 reps. Now, very few athletes will use uh, light loads training for muscular endurance as a staple of their training. I can see in some instances, like during, during some specific blocks of training that a distance athlete might use this or perhaps a cyclist or perhaps uh, you know, maybe an MMA athlete. But for the most part, if we're in the weight room, we're training for hypertrophy, strength, power, perhaps speed, although speed can be done outside of the weight room as well. And for muscular endurance, we tend to rely more on, on very sport-specific movements that you practice on the field or on the court that relate more directly to the sport. Okay, so here is that repetition maximum continuum. Now, to help you interpret this graph, we see that um, on this end are lower reps, and on this end are higher reps. And each of these bands, you see four bands going across in the rows, these are representing different uh, fitness characteristics, right? So we have strength at the top, power, hypertrophy, and then muscular endurance. And the larger the font, the greater the emphasis of that characteristic for that number of reps. So if you're training in you know, sets of five or less, then that's going to be strength and power primarily. But you do get a little bit of hypertrophy and a tiny bit of muscular endurance. Now power has an asterisk next to it because when you're training for power, you need to ensure that the loads are moved as fast as possible. Now in reality, with our athletes, we should have them move all loads as fast as possible on the concentric portion and then control the eccentric portion, right? So that means on the way up or when the muscle is shortening, we go as fast as we can. And on the way down or when the muscle is lengthening, we control it. And this is just to reduce injury. Athletes need to be explosive at all loads. And so we want to train that maximal acceleration. But power training specifically, we don't want to go as heavy as we can all the time because we need to stay just shy of that to really maximize the velocity component of the force times velocity. So for example, for, for power, if you're training with sets of three, so sets of three, and let's say that you are doing the back squat, and you can, your max is 100 kilograms. So your 3RM equals 100 kgs. You might want to train at 80% of that. So instead of 100 kilos for three reps, maybe you do 80 kilograms. Still very heavy, but you can actually move every repetition uh, very fast, right? And very explosively. And so that would be training power, uh, while doing 100 kilograms would be training strength. We're emphasizing strength. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, in sets of 6 to 12, this is going to be your primary hypertrophy range. And sets of 6 to 12, so 6 would be sort of on the heavy end for hypertrophy, and 12 would be a little bit on the lighter end for hypertrophy. But really, anything in between those really emphasizes hypertrophy. I'm not actually sure why they have a double asterisk next to hypertrophy, but it's really maximized in this range. Now, there are other things that you can do to maximize hypertrophy, namely 
accruing more and more volume or uh, using more load for the same number of reps. So let's say that for week one, you're doing you know three sets of 10. Week two, you could do four sets of 10. Week uh, five, uh, three, you could do uh, five sets of 10. And week four, you could do six sets of 10 and then have a deload week on week five. Or for each week, you can, improve, you can increase the load slightly for what you're doing for that set of 10. So week one, you do 80 kilograms. Week two is 82.5. Week three is you know 86. And then maybe week four is 90 kilograms for a set of 10. Uh, so that each week, you are adding a bit to that mechanical tension. Increasing your strength, because we see that these uh, rep ranges do improve strength to a fair amount, uh, but you're also increasing that mechanical tension. Or you could do a combination of both. Um, and then as we get outside of those sets of 12, really think anything over about 12 is starting to really get into this muscular endurance category. But we see that hypertrophy is still emphasized to a fair degree up to, you know, just shy of 20 reps. So this is why, for instance, bodybuilders tend to not often go heavier than a 6RM, you know, right here. And they sometimes train with sets of up to 20 or maybe even a little bit more because hypertrophy um, is emphasized you know, in this range, but then we still get some small hypertrophy gains on that side of 15. This is also why uh, strength athletes, pure strength athletes, don't just always stick to sets of five and lower, even though sets of five and lower maximize strength, there is still a lot of benefit to growing your strength over these reps, sets of six to 12, plus a bigger muscle is a stronger muscle, all things considered. So strength athletes often want to maximize hypertrophy and then focus on strength. And, and we'll get into all of this when we talk about periodization and how we can set up our different uh, uh, mesocycles of training. So when we're assigning load and repetitions based on the training goal, we have to consider what the training goal is. So if the training goal is strength, then our goal repetitions should be less than or equal to six, and our goal load should be greater than or equal to 85. Now, as a strength coach, you're not just going to put uh, anything less than six and be over 85% on, on the program. You're going to pick specific loads and specific repetitions, right? And the, the lower the repetitions, the greater the load. And of course, it's going to depend on how your session is set up and your week is set up and what uh, where that week falls in your month or mesocycle of training and where they are in the season, et cetera. If you're training for power, then for a single effort, you want 80 to 90% of your 1RM if you're trying to maximize power and the repetitions are one to two. This is something like uh, for shot put or discus, you know, or javelin or for a weightlifter where it's a single effort event. You get one big throw or one big toss or one attempt to lift the weight and then you get a long time to recover and then, uh, and then some time to do it again. If it's a multiple effort event, meaning any kind of team sport or any type of sprint or anything that lasts longer than just a couple seconds, then when you're training power, it is sometimes beneficial to do sets of three to five. So it's kind of a repeated power exercise. And then you want to drop a bit lower for your load. Now, in reality, uh, there are times when single effort event athletes will train in sets of three to five for power and when multiple effort event athletes will train with sets of one to two for power but this is just a recommendation of what to emphasize. If you're training for hypertrophy, then we want to train with sets of six to 12, between 67 to 85% roughly, and then for muscular endurance, really staying below 67% and greater than 12. Uh, we can also think about variation of the training load. So we shouldn't always be training as heavy as possible. Previously, we talked about using light days as recovery days, and uh, and therefore we can think about as coaches having heavy days, medium days, and light days in our training. So heavy day loads are designed to be full repetition maximums or near full repetition maximums. I, I don't believe that we should be training to full rep maxes all the time or even very frequently in training, um, but these would be the greatest resistance that can be successfully lifted for that goal number of repetitions. And you know, I would say if, if I was the coach, I'd probably say one shy of failure instead of going to true failure. There are times to go to true failure, but not very frequently. And then the loads for the other training days can be reduced in order to provide recovery after the heavy day while still maintaining sufficient training frequency and volume, right? So maybe have days of the week. Okay, and Sunday is gonna be a rest day. Let's say that we train heavy on Monday, we rest on Tuesday, we train medium on Wednesday, light on Tuesday, and then we can come back again and train, uh, or maybe we go rest day on Friday and then another heavy day on Saturday. Or, you know, I can maybe see switching those two up, 
training heavy on Friday and uh, resting on Saturday. So you get two full rest days. Or, you know, you could switch it up like this, maybe go light on Wednesday and then heavy on Tuesday. Don't train on Saturday. Sorry, this is getting confusing now. And then train again medium on Saturday. So yeah, rest on Friday, train medium on Saturday. So lots of ways to skin the cat. But the point is that we want to have heavy, uh, moderately heavy, medium, light, moderately light days. So we can vary the load. We're not always training at full blast. Now we also need to progress the load in training, as I mentioned before. So we want to be able to appropriately time load increases. When do we increase the load? Should we add five pounds every time we enter the gym? Probably not. But as the athlete adapts to the training stimulus, the loads must be increased so that improvements continue over time. Remember the principle of progressive overload. So we have to monitor athletes' training and their response to it. And this helps the strength and conditioning professional know when and to what extent loads should be increased. Now, the NSCA has this two for two rule. I don't really like it, but um, it's a great rule for, for starting out. You have to have some kind of rule when you start out of when to increase the load. So this is a, a very conservative method. And it says that if the athlete can perform two or more repetitions over his or her assigned repetition goal, so over their repetition goal, in the last set, all right, in two consecutive workouts for a given exercise, then weight should be added to that exercise for the next training session. So for instance, if you're benching and you're benching 60 kilograms for sets of 10, uh, 60 by 10, right? Or here, let me write this a different way. <clears throat> We're doing three sets of 10 at 60 kilograms. This is, this is the right way to write it. Three sets of 10 at 60 kilograms. Now, the first set, the athlete gets 10. The second set, and you know, and you know those, they stop at 10, right? They probably could get more. And then the next set, they do 10. And then on that last set, you say, okay, just get as many as you can. And let's say that they get 12, all right? So that would be two repetitions over his or her assigned. But we don't increase the load next time because we have to get this uh, in two consecutive workouts, all right? So let's say the next Monday rolls around and it's National Bench Day again, right? Every Monday is National Bench Day. So three by 10 at 60 is the assigned load. And so the athlete gets 10, they get 10, and then this time maybe they get 13, all right? And that is two over. And so now they have two consecutive days where they have bested the assigned uh, number of reps. And so the following Monday, in that third week, they have three by 10 at 60. Sorry, this is getting uh, laborious. <laughs> now, uh, now that can be upped, and instead of 60, you know, maybe it's 62 or 65 would be a big jump if this, let's say it's a more muscular, a larger individual, that bigger jump would be a little bit safer than if it was a small individual. And then now uh, it's an appropriate load and they hit 10, 10, 10, and it was challenging. Now variations in training status, in the volume of load that the athlete is undertaking, and in the exercise that you're using will greatly influence the appropriateness of load increases. So relative, increases of 2.5 to 10% can be used instead of that previous two for two rule. Now, if you have a smaller, weaker, less trained athlete, then we want to have smaller jumps. So two and a half to five pounds or five to 10 pounds if it's lower body. Larger, stronger, and more well-trained athletes, we can take slightly bigger jumps, five to 10 pounds or 10 to 15 pounds. Now, there's a caveat to this because I've seen where we, you know, somebody comes in as a small, weak trainee, right? Very, very untrained but then they start making rapid, rapid gains and they are just nailing the technique. They are enthusiastic in the weight room and you see that they start to be able to harness more and more of their strength. And those neural strength gains that we've talked about before really start to add up. And then suddenly, uh, whereas on the first couple of weeks, they were squatting you know, 95 pounds, now they can suddenly handle 135 like a boss. These are conservative tables, but you have to wait until you have a well-trained coach's eye to be able to detect like, okay, this kid can handle a bunch more weight. They're moving it fast. It's a crisp looking lift. They uh, have great technique. Let's start to load them up. You wouldn't, you wouldn't jump you know, straight from 95 to 135. Of course, you would have them do some sets uh, going up 10 each time. But what all I'm saying is you don't have to wait six weeks sometimes to make a slightly bigger jump at the beginning. All right, and that wraps up loads and repetitions. In the next part, we're going to be talking about volume and rest.